tell us um, your name and your age. I'm Devin Starkey. I'm 18. So Devin, we actually met you last night mm -hmm. when you came in during intake. First of all, talk to us about what's that like? How did this all happen? How did you come through that back door to begin with? Well, um, I was just walking down the street with my girlfriend and my stepbrother. And um, I guess I had a bench warrant for not appearing in court, and a cop knew me by face and just turned around and picked me up on my, when I was on my way home. So a bench warrant for not appearing in court. Tell me about... Sorry, making one change. You think it's quiet here, but it's not. But if Oliver's happy, we're all happy. Uh -huh. Good thing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Quiet on set, please. Still wrong. Are we good? So, you say you, say you got brought in for failure to appear in court. What court hearing? How did that all come about? Um. Well, my 18th birthday was June 26th, and um. I went on the run probably in the mid, mid to end of April, so I was 17 at the time, and my court date was June 2nd, so I would still have been 17. Um, the main reason I really couldn't come to court is, I mean, I was, I was scared. I didn't want to be locked up in placement for my 18th birthday. Um, I was doing good. I was on, well, I wasn't doing good. I mean, I was on my own, living from house to house wherever I could, but um, I was trying to... Actually, I think that was a turning point for me because I seen how hard it was. I mean, I couldn't make it on my own, so. So you, you had gotten in trouble before in the past, and you had had a court hearing, and they, I take it, put you on probation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then you had a follow-up court hearing, so it was that follow-up court hearing that you did not go to, and you didn't go to it because you were afraid of what they might say. Right. Well, I mean, I've been on probation since 2003 or 2004. I've had multiple violations. I mean, been sent to placements, boot camps. But um, this recent one, I got out of a boot camp last August and um, was doing good. And then I started smoking again. And then that's when I went on the run, scared to fail a drug test and stuff. So then I didn't come to court. Because you were on the run. Mm -hmm. Tell me what it's like to be out on the streets. When you say on the run, you literally had no place to live. Tell me what that's like. Well, the reason, I mean, I burnt all my bridges. Um, I, at first, I was living with my, my stepmom. I started bringing drugs and alcohol into her house. She kicked me out. Um, I got one of my closest friends arrested with me. His dad didn't want me there no more because we ever got him arrested. I just kept getting in trouble, bringing trouble all around me. So in the end, and then I was stealing from people that were closest to me. So no one really trusted me anymore. And um, so the past month or so, I mean, I've really been living, trying to find a place to live. But man, living out on the streets is tough. I mean, you gotta worry about where you're gonna sleep. I wake up every morning thinking about the night, later that night, where am I gonna sleep that night? It's kind of rough. And what are you gonna eat? Right. Um, your mom told us it was a really hard decision for her not to let you come home. Tell me what that was like when you knew you couldn't live at home anymore. Um, disappointing in myself, seeing that I've pushed my own mother far away where I wasn't allowed back. That's hard. That was hard for her too. And that's when you went out on the streets. Mm hmm was, was there a time when you were out on the streets that you called her and asked her to come home? Several times. So tell me about that. Um, I guess um, I, 
in my mind I wanted to change, but like I just wasn't proving it to her and she couldn't trust me. So I don't know, she had, she had to protect her household. So you were calling and asking, Mom, let me come home, and she said, no, can't come here. And I mean, I understood her reasoning, but I tried putting the blame on her so that way she would feel bad and let me come back. But in my mind, I knew I, knew I had to, uh, I had set that into place. You know, you, you talk about how, for whatever reason, you kind of, you bring trouble with you and you've burned your bridges. Is Fox about to send you a radio check. Um, do you ever stop to think, you know, before you do something, before you smoke or before you bring drugs around, do you ever stop to think, oh, man, maybe I shouldn't do this. This could be trouble, or is it just something that sort of happens? Just, um, well, when I say it's just something that sort of happens, I think to myself, well, how can you just let something happen over and over and over and not expect change? I mean, and expect change. If you're doing the same thing, nothing's going to change. But in a way, I mean, yeah, it just, it kind of happens. It's hard, it's even hard for me to understand sometimes. Have you had counseling? Has, has counseling worked at all? Or what, what do your counselors well, say? Well, what I've seen work for me a lot is a structured environment. Like I've been in placements, the boot camps. I do excellent in there. I don't get in no trouble or nothing, but as soon as I get the freedom of the streets, I'm out on my own, I do whatever. Whatever comes my way, I mean, I don't care. I mean disregard for the law, disregard for all authority. Because ultimately, you don't think you're a bad kid, do you? Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think other people think of you versus who you really are. Well, I have a pretty good um, reputation as a drug dealer, um, a gang member, um, just a bad kid, bullying, but in my mind, I see myself as um, a great athlete. I have athletic scholarship options already. A great student, which I have a 3.7 GPA. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm really intelligent. I learn on easily. It's just I make bad decisions. But bad decisions don't necessarily mean kids are bad kids. Right. If you could tell other people, what is it you could tell other people that you think they don't understand about kids like you? We don't mean to, we don't mean to be bad. It just it's not like we wake up that morning and say, um, "I'm gonna go out and do this. I'm gonna go rob this person." I mean, sometimes, I mean, well. Some kids in the situations, they don't need things. Like, if they're gonna go stealing, they don't have absolutely need it. But in other kids, a situation like mine, when I was on my own, I didn't have anyone giving me money. I had no job. So when I stole something, it's because I needed it. It's not because I wanted it or anything. Do you blame any of it on drugs or alcohol and getting involved in drugs and or alcohol or gangs? Where, if you could. Trace it all the way back. Where where do you remember it starting? Where did the trouble start? Well, I had this job for the post Tribune, and like I was 14, and uh, it was this guy in a van. He drove us all around, and we would walk up and down houses asking for people to sign up. Well, the kids in that van got me and started smoking weed with them. And then I started feeling out fake subscriptions, got in trouble for that. And then the weed that they gave me, I brought to school. I got in trouble at school from that. Got expelled. Then the next step was in trouble with the law. And then I was placed on probation because I was mad at, I got mad at the principal for expelling me. So I went out there and damaged his truck. So I got a criminal mischief charge. And then ever since then, it's been so hard for me to just stay clean and I've been stuck in the system. 
you ever feel hopeless, like there's no way out of the system once you get in? Talk to me about what it's like to actually be in the system. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that every day, but I see plenty of people like get in and get out of it. So I know it's not, it's not impossible, it's just you have to, it's a constant battle. You always have to be thinking, what are you doing? What's this gonna do to you? How's this gonna affect you? So you say you react well to structured environments and you've been in structured environments before. Tell us a little bit about the various places you've been since you've been in the system, whether that be in placement or boot camp. Tell us about those places. Where have you been? Um, my first time I was sent to Christian Haven. It's a um, residential placement in Wheatfield. And uh, that, I'm really, actually I'm grateful for being sent there because um, based on the name Christian Haven, I mean, it brought me a lot closer to God, brought me closer to myself, thinking about who I am and what I'm doing. I, um, I got caught up in school brought all my grades up, had job opportunities because they taught you vocationals there. Um, I've been there, I was there for 14 months, and then I got out, and uh, right when I got out, started back at the same stuff, back in the trouble. I mean, I think I was arrested three weeks after I got out of there. You know, people wonder, how is that possible? Well, you, you're gone for so long, and then you go right back to the same thing you were at before. Nothing's changed where you go home. It's just, it's easy to change when you leave the environment, but you go right back to the same environment, you're gonna be right back in the same situation. And um, my past, not this time, but the time before I came here, I was sent to um, Nevada. It's called Rite of Passage. It's a, a they say it's a placement, but it's a damn boot camp, man. These people are on your butt all the time. That was, and it's so far away from home, you don't get to see your parents or nothing. How long were you there? I was there nine months. So tell me about that nine months. What was it like from the time you woke up in the morning until the time you went to bed at night? You woke up at five in the morning, you put your sweats on and you go run three miles. Then you go to breakfast, then you go right out straight from breakfast to, you don't even get to use bathrooms, you go to a porta potties during the day. And you get 30 seconds, and 30 seconds in there, well, right after that you go do an 1820, which is 18 different exercises, 20 reps. And then after that, then you go to, it's called a GGM, a guided group meeting. It's 45 minutes long, and you just bring up what your issues are bring up any problems you have with your peers, something to just settle with disagreements throughout the day. Um, after that, you go to school for an hour and a half. Then after that, you do a cadence run, which is a two miles. You have to be in like two, two rows of lines of people. And you gotta be so far apart, you gotta be screaming out a cadence, running two miles. Then you go to lunch, then you go do another 18, 20 after lunch. I mean, you pretty sure you get the idea. I mean, I went there weighing 240 pounds, came out 187. Did it do you any good? Physically, physically, yes. Actually, that's where I got my welding degree. The vocational there I took very, um, very serious, because I mean, welding's something I found I enjoyed, and it's a pay is great, I mean, I got certified when I was out there, the um, instructor Ron Stock and um, Mr. C, pretty good guys. They taught me a whole new world of things. So when you left there and came back home, did you think that maybe that was going to be the time that... I did, actually. I mean, when I got home, I, got, I had a job, I had a mentor, I had a therapist coming to my house, a substance abuse counselor. Um, I had school. My schedule was packed from morning to end, so I mean, it was still structured. But once, once I, they seen their stuff was going well, they started to put me back into the same environment I was in. And then I had lost my job. 
I got arrested with a half pound of weed. My car got impounded. And then that's when my mom started seeing I'm risking her house. And I've been pretty much on my own since. So you're less than 24 hours away from your court hearing tomorrow. Tell me what's going through your mind as you think about another court date, another juvenile court date. Oh, man. Not really, not much, because, I mean, I've been through so many of these court dates. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's right now in my head, it's a 50-50, detained or released, because uh, it's my, de my uh, detention hearing. But I know I'm, that now that I'm 18, the, legally, they can't hold me no more than 120 days, so... I'm not really too worried about it, but at least I get this out of the way, this warrant, and be able to move on. Have you talked to your probation officer yet or anything? No. So you say the most they can give you, I know by law, is 120 days. Yeah. How do you think you'll react if they re-detain you? I mean, I'm going to be upset, yeah, but what can I do? I don't got a key to just to walk out. I'm gonna have to do it and just wait. Is there, since you're 18, is there any fear that they might try and wave you to adult? Tell me about any thoughts you might have on the fact that you're 18. Um, well, I really don't think that they'd wave me because I haven't committed any recent crimes. Haven't had any charges pressed since I've, not even since I was 17, I didn't really get any charges. It was just a basic bench warrant that landed me here this time because I didn't go to my court hearing, which was going to let me be released from probation. Do you think you'll be able to tell the judge in court if, if she asks you, what were you thinking? Why didn't you show up for your court date? What are you prepared to tell her? I was on my own. I was scared. I mean, you think about it. A judge, you got this prosecutor, that's a, a lot of big people to go against when you're just by yourself. I didn't know, I wasn't with my mom, we weren't speaking, so it was just me. And you didn't want to have to face that alone. Right. So what is your relationship with your mom now? Talk to me about your mom and what you think your relationship is now. Um, well, we just started recently speaking when I got shot in the arm on the 5th of August. That's when um, she came to the hospital she, and she just started crying and then took me home and we'd been trying to build another, build our relationship back up, but um, I'm grateful for her because she's always stuck there for me, even though I push her away. Do you feel like You've put her through a lot, and she's also put you through a lot? Oh, um, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about the night that you got shot. Kind of set the scene for us. You were... I was out with some friends, drinking a little bit. Um, an opportunity came for me to make some money. And I guess I was messing with the wrong guy at the wrong time, and I got shot. But that was that was something that got me thinking a lot. I mean, I still I've still been thinking since this happened. I, I should be dead right now. The only reason I'm not is because I moved at the last second. So what do you do? Just pull out a gun? And yeah, yeah. I pulled because he was in the car, and he pulled it out from under the seat and had it right at my chest, like right next to me. But, I mean, it got me thinking, I can't be doing this. I'm 18 years old. I got a lot of years to live. And if I keep messing around with this, I'm gonna end up dead or in jail. What's your biggest fear? Um, failing, failing at life. Cause I know I have, I have all the essential tools and capabilities to carry me anywhere I want to go, but it's just um, me finding a way to use them. What 
what or who could help you do that? If, if you... I don't think anyone. Like, I mean, I told you yesterday, I'm the type of person that learns from what I go through. Somebody can tell me over and over and over, don't do this, this is what will happen. I won't believe them until I do it for myself. And um, I'm just, right now I'm searching through me to find where, what I wanna do. And um, I think really um, my girlfriend, Caitlin, she's got a real inspiration on me. She, um, she always pushes me not to go with my friends pushes me, um, and the night I got shot, right before it happened, I talked to her. I was on the phone with her and she was like, don't, she was telling me, don't do it, don't do it, you're gonna get shot one of these days. And then that same night, If somebody um, said, okay, Devin, here's the deal, you get a fresh start, we're gonna set you up, we'll give you a job, put you in any neighborhood you want to live in. Do you think your life could be totally different? Do you Most feel definitely. I was just right the night, actually the night before I got arrested, Friday night, I was sitting there talking with Caitlin and I was asking, I was telling her, I was like, I wish I could just go back to when I was 10 years old. With the knowledge that I have now, man, I could I could be anywhere if I wouldn't have started messing around with the drugs. As soon as I get this legal trouble out of the way, I mean, I know I'm gonna have a good job. I wanna start a family. And I think that family, having a family of my own, it'll just show me that I know I can make it in life. I know I can do the right thing. Who do you wanna prove that to more than anybody? Myself. Do you feel like maybe, does, does it ever make you sad to think that maybe enough people don't believe in you? Okay, kids tell me, you know what, I know I'm a good kid, I believe in myself, I just don't feel like anybody else believes in me anymore. Right now I'm at that point. My family, they don't believe me. Well, they didn't. My mom's trying to believe me right now. Um, the teachers. And pretty much everyone, they're just telling me, they just, because I've, I've lied so much, I've always, past four years, every time I've gotten in trouble, I'll be like, all right, this is the last time, I'll say whatever I can say to get out of trouble. But this time I can't say nothing, I just have to show them. Are you afraid of what the prosecutor might say? No. What do you think would be the best outcome from court tomorrow? What do you hope? Release, um, discharge from probation, because I'm 18. I mean, I hope the judge will just sit there and just be like, look, we're done, juvenile is done with you. You're 18 years old. You're in trouble from here on. You're going to the county. There's nothing else they can do, pretty much. And I'm hoping for that because I know for right now, I mean, I'm getting, I have a job coming right now. I got my GED testing on the third. Um, I'm back in school. I'm trying to get this apprenticeship as a welder. I got a lot of good things going for me right now. I'm working on my relationship. My mom let me come back home. So it's not like I'm out running the streets anymore. And my mom set very firm ground rules for me to come back home. and. We both agreed the first violation of them, I'm back out. Because this is a big um, step of trust for her. You think you can do it? Yeah. You've obviously had a lot of contact with police over the years. Do you feel like you've been treated fairly by law enforcement or do you ever feel like you've been targeted by law enforcement? What's your experience been and how you've been treated? Well, the first couple times, they, I was treated fairly, but once they started having to return to the home, they get less and less patient with me, 
less and less courteous. But in a way, I just think, I mean, I've done it to, I'm, I'm doing it to myself. They should, there's no reason they should have to come back and back and back just because of the things that I do. It's sort of on the same line, you've been on probation in the past. What's your experience been with your probation officers? Do you feel that probation works? Um, actually, I think I've had a wonderful probation officer. Dave Plavik, he's, he's stuck with me every time. He's helped me, giving me plenty of chances, but at the same time, he's put his foot down plenty of times when I've gone too far. What's the toughest thing about being on probation? Tell me about probation. If, if a kid's never been on probation, what's the good and the bad of probation? And the good, I, they gave you a chance and they didn't lock you up. The bad, you have to stay on this thin line. You don't have, you don't have any margin for error or you're hit. Do they interact a lot with you? Do you see them a lot? Do you talk to them? How much? Not really. To believe, be honest, not really. I mean, the only time I did see him is when I contacted him, or he, my, my, I think my probation officer showed up maybe three times since I've been out to my house. What about being in a place like this, in a detention center? Tell me what it's like to actually be detained. Well, no matter how much filming you guys do here, it's not showing nothing what it's like because I guarantee it, it's completely different when you're gone. I mean, I've been here three, this month, I've been here four times, it's the first time you guys have been here. Usually half the time, like I was telling them earlier, they don't let you brush your teeth, maybe once a week. They barely give you, give you bars of soap in the shower. They'll give you one towel. I mean, they humiliate you. Um, I've seen it personally where a, DO, where a kid was talking to a D.O. disrespectfully. He opened up the kid's tray and spit in his food and gave it to him. They do not treat you fair here at all. They don't care if this is just a job for them and they can do whatever they want because there's a law here. So what's the hardest part for you about being locked up in a place like this? Not ta or taking their crap. I mean, you have to take it, otherwise you're not getting out of here. You're just, you're just gonna catch more charges. What's it like to sleep here? There is no sleep. I mean, these kids banging on the doors. I mean, that's a pretty loud noise when you think about it. Every door down this hallway, people screaming. I mean, banging on walls. Throughout the night, you hear that loud ass toilet flushing. No privacy, I mean, the floors are dirty. It's disgusting, I mean, you sleep in some whitey tidies, no clothes, they give you a couple thin ass blankets. Not a fun place to be. No. So for kids out there who think it might be some badge of honor to come to detention, what would your... What would your advice be to other kids who'd be watching a show? Me personally, I don't like telling people I've been here. It's, it's actually a shame on you. I mean, I wouldn't want to come here. This is no place to be. What advice would you give other kids who might be heading down a similar path that you've gone down? Say a 13-year-old gangster wannabe is watching this. What advice do you have for well, you see where it got me. You go ahead and keep doing what you want to do. You're going to end up just like me, in and out of placements. I mean, I've been locked up three of the past four years. Three of the past four years, that's a lot of my childhood. Teenage years, right down the drain. I mean, this is the time I'm supposed to be having the most fun of my life. I've been inside these damn cells. Does any of it do any good? Does any kind of lockup, do you think no. any kind of lockup works for a kid? No. What does lockup do? Lockup lock up is nothing but time. You come here, you do a little bit of time, you get right back out, you're doing the same thing. It's just a matter of when they catch you. That's how I thought of it. The most of the help that I got really was, I mean, 
the harder situations that I personally went through, let alone the boot camp. That kind of helped me discipline me more, gave me a lot of respect for authority. Um, kids, when they're locked up, all they think is, oh, my freedom's gone, but they can't keep it forever, so I got away with it. I'm going to get out eventually. I know you said you, you might have a baby on the way. Yeah. When you think about having your own kids and knowing what you've been through, what kind of a parent do you think you'll be? I know I'm going to be an excellent father. I know that for sure. I mean, my dad right now, he's in jail, about to be sentenced to prison soon. Um, and I know right now, I look at myself and I was this close to getting into jail. I mean, I was in the adult system at 17 for that half pound of weed and they were trying to charge me for distribution. And um, I'm, I'm thankful for the second chance they gave me but I know I don't want my kid to grow up fatherless. And I mean, I want to share every little thing that I went through with my kid and tell him where it got me and where it didn't get me. Do you ever blame any of your problems on your dad taking off? No. Huh? No. Has he been any influence in your life at all? Yeah, I mean, I lived with him for a few years. I mean, we always, we've always had contact always talked. He just recently went to jail. But and he always he always got on my butt about the stuff I did. It always got on me, but it, that really wasn't enough, I guess, because he would just just yell at me, but it'd be a disappointment for me just for that few minutes he was yelling right after he got done. I was back to doing it. So how how do you feel Deep down inside about your dad serving time. What's that like? He's a big boy, he can handle it. It's his, I mean, he made the mistake. He's gonna have to do it now. I mean, that's the same way I think about myself. Any final words you wanna say before court tomorrow or for anybody who might be watching who hopefully now has a better understanding of what it's like for you to go through this. Anything you want to say though, to people? When um, the bad choices that we make, I mean, just because we make them, it doesn't, doesn't distinguish your whole life. I mean, a lot of people don't know all the good things that I've done. I mean, I've won state titles for computer um, programs that I've made. I'm, I've I do have done a lot of good, but people just see the negative and base that on your entire life. It's really not that way. If we were to come visit you, say, 10 years from now, what do you think your life would be like down the road? Um, stable. Um, I know I might have a family, have a house, have a reliable job. And... If you could even say, if you come to see me 10 years from now, you come to see me a year from now? No, when you come and see me 10 years from now, you will see me with a house, a family of my own, a stable job, and just the perfect picture of life. Um, we've talked a lot about your feelings about your future and yourself. Do you ever think about the people you've beaten up and robbed? And well, I mean, yeah, I have, but... Tell me in a full yeah. sentence. Yeah, I think actually, you can sit down. I'll... Hmm? I know there's, there's good in all you kids, yet there's also victims on the other side who you know, now are going through their own issues. Do you, do you think about your victims at all? I think of it as, I mean, I've been a victim. They can be a victim, it's just life. It comes at you, it goes at you. Everyone gets their turn playing the, the taker, the getter, the... Were your victims 
random victims or were they people, I mean, was it other gang members or was it just, could it have just been somebody walking down the street? Could out? have been someone walking down the street if I seen someone that I liked. I mean, it's no, no categorization or anything. I didn't categorize anything. So I could have been somebody walking out of a grocery store and you could have said, she's got a big purse. I wonder if there's money in that purse. Mm-hmm. So it wouldn't have mattered who it was. So tell me, kind of tell me about that mindset. Like, what goes through your mind? Well, like, I'm, I'm not the type of person just to go rob anybody. I mean, I don't really do that. I mean, I've drug dealers, yeah, because who cares if they get robbed? I mean, they're doing it illegal anyways. But um, I try not to pick on people that have their stuff going straight because that's eventually what I want to be, is have my life on, on track. So do you have any remorse for anything you did in the past? Do you ever? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, you what? I do, I feel bad for him. For people I've, I mean, I'm not gonna go into details, but people that I've done harm to. Because I, I think that's the other thing judges and, you know, people wanna know is, some kids don't have remorse. Actually, one, one person comes to mind is my mom. I mean, I've done so much bad to her, cussed her out, um, stole from her, broken her things, destroyed the house just because she made me angry. I mean, and my mom, she, I grew up with a, my mom being a single mom. She still has no diploma. She didn't have a job with two kids by the time she was 18. And she supported us. She, and right now my mom has a great job. She's got a brand new car. She has her own, she owns her house. I mean, she went from nothing to having what, everything you need. So you feel sorry that you've caused her grief, but you're glad that she's finally back on her feet. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll help. How do you think you're gonna feel the first time you see your mom in court tomorrow? Disappointed that she has to see me like this again. I mean, it's not, it can't be too easy on her seeing her kid in a jumpsuit and shackles. Do you think you'll be able to find it in yourself tomorrow during court to, some kids clam up in court? They know what they want to say, and then court day comes. No, that's not me. I mean, I've all I've had a I'm not gonna say a good relationship with my judge because I feel my judge does not like me. But I never, I'm never quiet. I'm the type of person if I got something to say, I'm gonna say it to anyone. So you're not intimidated by a mm -hmm. judge or a courtroom or no. Final words. Go ahead, Chip. You, obviously the state and the courts have intervened a number of times in your life and usually they've responded by locking you up. And you were saying before how you know, that doesn't really do much to rehabilitate, it doesn't do much to, to really help you with get on a better path. Let's say 10 years down the line, you, you fought for that perfect life for yourself and then you have an opportunity to affect you know, the way the state does handle kids like you. You know, so going back to some of the earliest times you got in trouble, um, what do you think? What do you think a better, better way to respond, a better response that would have helped you get back and help other kids get back on a better track, rather than just locking them up, understanding that you've got to do something. They've done wrong. They need punishment. Right. They need guidance. So talk to Karen about some ideas you think that a better way to do all of this. Better way to help kids. If you could talk to the governor for a half hour. And he said, okay, Devin, you get to help me make the laws for juveniles. What should we do? Um, number one, I would say is put more time into it. Don't just shove a kid in the cell and say, here you go, you're done. I mean, you got to actually work with him. I mean, you got to, if he doesn't know how to behave right, how's he going to learn it if no one's there to show him? 
I mean, you can't, kids don't just think of it on their own. I mean, the, the court system are, is telling us that we, can, we have to be better. Well, show us how we have to be better. Show us how we can change. Show us how we can grow to be a, a productive citizen of society. Do you think a lot of adults and, and politicians just really have no clue what it's like to be in this system? Do you ever think about that? I, well, I think that the ones that had that grew up in this situation, they might. I mean, they do. But if you know, if you've never been through this, then I don't think they do. They have what? They have a, um, an idea of how how you how people portray it. I mean, you don't ever really get the full full um, subscription or whatever of how it is until you've been here. So, if you were a judge and a kid came through your court and he was uh, brought in for drugs, conversion, auto theft, how do you think you'd handle a kid like that? Well, the first thing is I'm gonna put him in drug classes. I mean. He's doing the drugs, then people think they obviously are influencing him, thinking it's a cool thing that they're good for you or whatever. But and me personally, drugs is my downfall. That's what got me started, and that's where I fall every time. And in my case, I need a lot of moral support when I'm at home. I need support from friends, families, teachers, anyone. What what makes you want to do drugs? Are you trying to just it's not that I, I mean, not that I like doing them with anybody else, not that people influence me, but I just like the rush that they give you, maybe, the, and they take away a lot of the problems. When you're around them, you don't think about nothing. It's a lot easier to forget about pain in your life if you're high or if you're drunk or you're... Right. Well, that's pretty much what most kids do. What would make you stay away from drugs? The single biggest thing somebody could do for you that would make you stay away from drugs. What would Actually, it what has stopped me now is um, her. She told me if, if I didn't quit drinking, we were done. I haven't drank since. So your girlfriend really is key for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Can we sit still for like 20 seconds and record this? 20 seconds of silence. Sounds like, and you can answer to Karen. It sounds like you know you've been involved with the courts and the judicial system a lot. Do you? And, and you can answer as honestly as you really feel. Do you feel like you owe anything back to society? Um, as many opportunities as this, as Lake County, the judicial system has given me. My the only thing I can really give in return is to be a productive citizen. I mean do as best as I can and give back to what they've given me. Have you ever thought of apologizing to any of your victims or making amends? Um, not really, I haven't really thought about it, but I'm not sure. It'd probably be a good idea, but. And have you thought about writing a letter to the judge at all or have you done that in the past? I have. I've done that in the past, but never they never respond to it. I don't even think they get the letters. They do. Do they? Oh well, they've never responded to any of mine. Um, if you had to guess what the outcome of tomorrow's court hearing will be, any guess? 
Mm, I'm guessing anywhere from 15 to 60 day commitment, and then I'm done. Can you handle another 15 to 60 days? Long? Easily. That's what I mean is, if you think about it, I've been through three years of this. It's what's another 15 days to two months? Nothing. And the worst thing that could happen tomorrow? 120 days. <laughs> that might be a little bit hard, spending it in this place, but... But if you have to, you will. Yeah, if I have to, it wouldn't be a problem. Not the hurt arm, the one with the tattoo. I just wanted because you referred to oh. her. Or just kind of hold it like you were, but you just had referred to it at one point. Did you have that done? Yeah. Yeah, because that's a good. I've seen kids who've done them themselves, but that's like a. I can't quite. Actually, Pierre's got it. Oh, okay. well, I got it when we were on intake, but he kind okay. of referred down to it at some point. Yeah, just kind of. Yeah. Oh, you mean like that? I think you would look down at it and say, oh. she. Um, a motor out of a tape player, um, Vaseline, rope, and a battery, and a safety pin. Are you kidding me? Nope. The Vaseline, he burned, he put the Vaseline like candle, on a can, emptied out the candle wax of a metal, little metal candle holder, put the Vaseline in there with the rope coming up, lit the rope, held that on fire and the ink, and it turned into ink and dropped into the tube. Dipped the safety pin and did that. <laughs> Just by hand? No, the the motor, the motor. The motor. He, he tied the safety pin to a uh, the the little motor, and as it spun, it just went up and down. And then he connected it to a L, like a L bracket. Can I see the detail? Yeah. That is unbelievable. Did it hurt? Wow. Yeah, a little. Just the outline, but. Okay. It's pretty amazing.